You know, we've heard a lot of great communicators this morning already. And without a doubt, though, the greatest communication story in the world, the greatest communication success story in the world is the spread of the church across the Mediterranean world in the first century, the spread of Christianity. Do you realize that from the day of Pentecost until the end of the second century, the church grew from a few hundred people to actually over six million? Isn't that incredible? Uh, I, I, you, we might credit to great preachers like Peter and Paul and other great communicators that spread the gospel around the world uh, of their day like that. But, and we also might think about, wow, Paul had this incredible strategy of planting churches in cultural centers. That's pretty smart. And letting them take the gospel out into the countryside. And all those are really important. I'm sure they, they were of an important part of God's strategic plan for spreading the gospel to the world. But there's really something even more important than that. And that was ordinary Christians who had a passion for knowing Christ and a passion for making him known in their everyday life. You see, the hist both history and the New Testament tell us that the gospel spread across the Mediterranean world along the lines of commerce and trade. And as the Bible tells us, the, the gospel spread from oikos to oikos, house to house, or oikos to oikos in Greek. And the oikos was not just a place where a family lived. It was really the place of business. In the, the Greco-Roman world, it was actually the basic economic unit of that culture, the small business of the day. And it was in those relationships in and between oikoi that Christians shared the gospel with their friends, with their colleagues, with their customers, with masters, with slaves, with students, with, with uh, teachers, and among their fellow soldiers, that the gospel spread across the world through these relationships that were built in the workplace. Now today, we're experiencing an incredible exponential growth of Christianity today in the, in the uh, global south. Every day, 74,000 people come to Christ in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, according to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Garden Codwell. And that is so exciting. We're living in one of the most exciting days in the world right now. In China today, 10,000 people are coming to Christ every day there. And by the year 2030, it's estimated that China will be the world's most populous Christian nation. Isn't that interesting? The greatest uh, atheistic nation, the largest atheistic nation in the world becomes the most populous Christian nation in the world. Now, where are we? Well, the sad news is that kind of the exact opposite is happening in the global north, in uh, Europe and North America. While the Christianity is declining, it seems like atheism and agnosticism is growing. And that's the very sad news here. Um, now, that begs a serious question to me. And I want to know why. Why is it that 75% of people that live in the United States say they are looking for ways to find more meaning in life? And we have 300,000 plus churches and 600,000 plus clergymen. And Christianity is shrinking. While unreligious people, that population is growing. In a day when our culture is moving further and further and further away from Christ, we, we might think that it's harder to communicate the gospel to people. And in a way, that's true. It's certainly harder to get people to go to church. There was a study released just yesterday that said that 43% of the citizens of the United States are now considered unchurched. It's hard to get people to visit a church today. It's also hard to get them to sit down and listen to a gospel presentation by a stranger. And it's certainly hard to get them to go to a crusade. But there is a door open for evangelism that is still wide open, and that is through personal relationships. 70 to 90% of adults that come to Christ as adults come to Christ because of a relationship they had with a Christian outside the church. 
And that is an open door that is incredible to take advantage of today. We have an opportunity, you see, in the workplace. And that's what makes the workplace so valuable, because we have the opportunity there to not only tell people about Christ, but to show them what it looks like to have a relationship with him and to show what kind of meaning Christ actually brings to our lives. And that's a privilege and opportunity that every Christian has. You know, Paul tells us that we're all called to be ambassadors, whether we're a plumber or a pastor, whether we're an evangelist or electrician, or whether we're a missionary or a mechanic. All of us are called to share the gospel with people. Whether we are part of the 99% of the church that does not have the gift of evangelism or the 1% that does, this is our responsibility. So the question I have is why? Why aren't vast numbers of people, given these advantages and the numbers of Christians that still live in America, why are, 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 aren't people, more people coming to Christ in North America and Europe than in the global south? And what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to talk about something that we can do something about as faith and work leaders. There are all kinds of reasons that are causing this. But there's a couple of things that we actually can do something about that will really help. The first thing is this. and The first problem is that few Christians see evangelism as their assignment where they, they work. Um, we've made a lot of headway, I think, in overcoming the secular sacred divide that sees work as something that's less important to God than actual church work, church ministry. But the fact is that there is still a huge divide when it comes to evangelism. People don't understand how important that is to everyday life, to the everyday life of the believer in the workplace. The fact is there, there are millions of people that we can envision and equip to take the gospel message into the workplace, to do that appropriately and effectively. And the second thing that I think we can address is that few Christians seem to understand what evangelism really is. And we probably know people at both ends of a particular spectrum here, don't we? On one hand, there's this group of people that think that the whole value of the workplace is as a platform for evangelism, right? You know these people, they're aggressive. They're looking for, you know, a person that they can buttonhole with the gospel. And they share the gospel with them, boom, get them to pray the prayer, and man, another, another notch on their belt. And they have no, have no understanding in reality of how many barriers they're creating in the workplace by an overly aggressive model of evangelism, trying to find meaning for themselves in their work by, by evangelism. On the other hand, there are these people over here who think that it's absolutely inappropriate to talk about faith at work. And they're quiet. They shut up. They don't talk about it. Uh, they don't. They don't. Uh, they don't uh, ask people to to uh, to think about their spiritual needs. They keep their mouth shut. So the question I have is somewhere between this. How in the world does evangelism actually fit in the workplace? Well, Jesus uh, tells us that it's all about being salt and light. Both of those uh, people need the light. They need to see that God is absolutely passionate uh, about uh, his work and his, his, his creation. But he's and he, passionate about what he's done. He's gone to extraordinary means so that we can have a relationship with him. But they need to hear that in gradual doses so that we don't blind people with the light when we show them the light. So gospel living, the salt part, really always goes before gospel speaking, the light part. So how do we as faith and work people, uh, leaders, help people understand this? Well, again, this was a problem that Dr. Walt Larimore and I faced when we began to create medical continuing education courses for the Christian Medical and Dental Association uh, to teach doctors how to share their faith appropriately with their patients in the medical marketplace. And the Christian... Uh, Healthcare professionals that, that we spoke with were well aware of the obligation that they had to be light. And quite frankly, that's what bothered them. Uh, they knew that this was their responsibility. But the problem is that they had this model of evangelism that they had learned on the college campus for the most part that was confrontational. And so they turned the light on brightly to their patients and caused some real issues there. Now, you don't have to be... Uh, you don't have to be a neurosurgeon to realize, you know, a doctor has just done a, um, 
a yearly checkup on a patient. And uh, he goes through his blood pressure and everything, everything's good. And he says, pardon me, do you, do you mind if I ask you a question? If you should die tonight, where would you spend eternity? <laughs> that creates a lot more heat than light. It creates a lot more fear than faith, doesn't it? And so these guys just quit. They stopped. They said, this isn't appropriate. I can't do this, rather than looking for a, another way to do that. And that is a real, real problem. So it's with not a lot of, you know, without a significant amount of guilt that a lot of physicians decided that, hey, this just doesn't work. And they stopped doing it. But that guilt gro drove them to actually, a lot of them, to leave their practice and go on the medical mission field. Or if they couldn't do that, to drudge their way through, tw through 50 weeks of seeing patients still, they could finally go on the mission field and share Christ like they really wanted to out, uh, out in Africa or Latin America or Asia or someplace like that. Now, the continuing medical education courses that were created showed thousands of doctors how they could appropriately talk about faith in their workplace with their patients, how to foster and recognize spiritual interest in their patients' lives and turn the light on just a little bit at a time incrementally so that the patients could begin to see what Christ had done for them, but absolutely always with respect, with sensitivity, and with their permission. Now, here's the take home for us today that I'd like you to see and that, that will help make Make, help us take evangelism into the workplace appropriately. So when we begin to help people understand this, to see the, the connection between work, faith and work here, that salt always comes before light. Uh, and when the doctors begin to see this possibility uh, in their lives, to see that it was appropriate, they not only gained a new vision for how to actually integrate faith into their practice. But they actually, this is kind of in some ways counterintuitive. Rather than thinking that evangelism was the only thing, they begin to see that actually the physical things that they did that helped create physical flourishing for their patients were actually helping them spiritually as well from God's perspective. And here's what we see here. This, this is how these, we see these going together. There are three components that are very important to understand here as far as being salt in the culture is concerned, uh, in, in the workplace culture. And the first thing, the first component is competence. Competence is doing our best work, putting our heart into it, providing excellent products and services. That, that's where evangelism really begins, and we need to understand that. It's creating human flourishing by our, by our good work that actually lays the foundation for evangelism. And here's the bottom line. If we want people to pay attention to our, our faith, the first thing we need to pay attention to is our work. The second thing is our character. Uh, people need to see Christ in us. People may be attracted by a jerk. It doesn't matter how good you are at something. If you're a jerk, people don't want to hear about your faith here at all. But people are attracted to who Christ is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's not enough to do good work. There's got to be something attractive about us personally. And when they see that, competence and character coming together, it gives our words authority uh, as w when we speak to patients uh, or, or, health, or, or people in the workplace that we have the opportunity to share Christ with. The third component is actually concern, showing people we care. And it's true, what's the saying? People don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And when people know we care, that gives us the ability to talk to them. It opens the door for us. They want to actually listen to us and to be a, begin to share Christ appropriately with them through this open door. Os Guinness said it well. He said, far more than we realize, the soul of business is closely connected to the business of the soul. Here's how we summarize it. Gospel speaking without gospel living is uninviting. Gospel living without gospel speaking is negligent. But gospel living and gospel speaking are really life-changing. That means every encounter with every person that we have is spiritually significant. That's why Paul closed the end of Colossians, the end of his section on how to live appropriately in the Oikos with this passage. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. 
May God help us to be faithful in teaching this to the people we work with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And I have, I have two questions, actually. I want you to tell us a little bit about this latest edition of your book. But before you do that, um, I don't, I'm just going to speak personally. I don't feel like I could ever be good enough in character or even excellent enough at my work to be that credible in the eyes of people as you're talking about. So for those of us who are extremely flawed human beings, how could we be better at evangelizing? Well, one of the questions that I think I've been asked a lot is, oh my gosh, you know, I've made so many mistakes. How People would never want to listen to me. And the fact is that people aren't looking for perfect people, but they are looking for honest people. And they're looking for humble people that would admit those mistakes and confess them. And that is, what I think, one of the really crucial things. You know, none of us is good enough. None of us is good enough to, to witness Christ without words. And, uh, you know, if you think you can do that, you're incredibly self-righteous because um, none of us is that, that good, actually. Uh, the new book. Yes. Yeah, Workplace Grace, which you all received in your packets, hopefully, is a brand new edition of a book that Dr. Laramore and I created after creating these medical evangelism courses to talk about uh, how to share your faith in the, uh, in the workplace outside the medical, the medical marketplace. We just redid this this last year. You're actually receiving the very first copies of that. And so we hope you enjoy it. We updated it, made it a little more pertinent to our culture uh, because it was originally written about 10 years ago.